quick, Connie. Uh, is that okay? Yeah, that sounds okay. good. I Do we have the ability to share a screen as well? You should be able to, let me see. Okay. Yeah, I see that it's active. Cool, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I can quickly kick things off and then I was gonna hand it over to Amanda. Um, hey, everybody that just joined. Uh, my name is Ankur. I'm joined by some colleagues uh, in the chat in the conference as well. I've got Amanda and Ian, who is uh, under the alias Plant Hero team. And uh, we're a little company called Plant Hero. Uh, we basically help people all over the US with their houseplants and their garden uh, through virtual one on one calls. And we started doing classes last year. And we're just hoping to get as much as uh, as much of all the lessons we're learning from all the people we're helping out to a broader audience. So um, thank you, Gita and Connie, for giving us a platform to teach you today. Um, well, I'll hand it over to Amanda, who's going to be teaching most of this class. We were hoping to do somewhere between 20 to 25 minutes of content, and feel free to ask questions in it. Um, but then we are also happy to help you with your plans or take questions at the end as well. Um, so with that, I'd love to pass it over to Amanda. Um, Amanda. Thank you. Um, yes, and just a disclosure, I am on the East Coast right now, so if I seem a little sleepy, it's 10.30 <laughs> p.m. over here. Um, I am in sunny Florida, which is where I have the luxury of being a professor of horticulture. So I spend all day with plants and people, which was literally my dream as a child. So plants, people, and bugs, which is actually what my degree is in. So that's my expertise is really plant pests, um, though having lived in sunny Florida now for a while, that's progressed into fruit trees as well as house plants, um, like the ones behind me here. So definitely happy to answer your questions as I'm going through the presentation. And if you would like a copy of my presentation afterwards, I'm happy to send that to you as well. Yeah, I actually, have... Oh, sorry, uh, I had a quick question, Amanda, for everybody. It'd be really cool to hear and if, hey, hey Gunjin, it'd be really cool to hear um, what what folks like favorite plants are or vegetables that they're growing right now. It'd just be really nice if you can. Um, if you can't speak on audio, even just entering it in the chat would be really cool. It'd just be nice to see um, what folks lean towards when it comes to plants. Um, yeah, absolutely. I can start. Um, yeah. So I've been planting the um, ends of the vegetables that we are eating like celery i haven't done um carrots so much but i know that my bed is not very deep so i don't know how that would go um but i've been doing the green onions like growing very well and um i'm trying to do garlic um but mostly just vegetables that we eat so that's what I've been doing. Cool. Yeah, you can regrow just about everything that you buy at the grocery store, especially in the area you guys live. It's not going, it's not all going well though, but I'm trying. <laughs> I think Gunjan is saying she's trying to grow a cauliflower in her backyard for the first time, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That one is actually surprisingly fun too, the way that you actually get to see it flower and everything else. Um, it's a fun one. Yeah, she says she loves hanging plants indoors, but has a black thumb. I, I do too, which is probably going to shock you as to why I'm starting a company called Plant Hero, but that's exactly why I started this is because I wanted to understand more about it. Um, does anybody else uh, want to share before we continue? Yeah, so I'm going to, I can go next. So we Perfect. have a little patio and I have do not have a green thumb, my husband does. So he kind of has started doing a little herb garden. Um, so we had tomato plants, uh, peppers, jalapenos, um, aloe vera. So yeah, I'm not an expert, but he has several different varieties and he keeps experimenting. We have a little avocado plant. I don't know what's gonna happen with that. But yeah, so I guess, uh, we want to expand more, but like given our space constraint and like we don't get direct sunlight all the time. Um, so yeah, I love to hear, you know, kind of wanting to grow that side of our, you know, hobby, but kind of working with what we have. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's speaking my language. Um, by the way, if anybody has any fruit or vegetable questions during this, please, by all means, I could talk about that all day. I live on a six acre food forest. Every part of my yard is covered with something edible. Wow. wow. That's amazing. That's, yeah, like living here in the Bay Area. I don't even know what that looks like. <laughs> Well, cool. Shall we, shall we hop into the, the content, Amanda? Sounds good to me. Oh, it looks like the host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, yeah, that's a setting you'll have to adjust. Connie, is that on? Are you able to do that now? Yeah, it looks like it, it's working now. Great. Sorry about that. All right. Are you guys able to see my screen here? Yes. Uh, yep. yep. Perfect. Okay, let me go ahead and start the slideshow. All right, and everybody's able to see this okay? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, so this is um, really just all about houseplants. But again, if you have questions about your, your fruits and vegetables, by all means, chime in. I'm always happy to answer those, and especially at the end here. But this kind of just covers some of the basics, especially if you've been on the fence about getting a houseplant because you think you have a black thumb. I'm gonna cover some of the basics to really help kind of take the edge off there, as well as make suggestions for some really hard to kill houseplants. So the kinds of things that you need to kind of look out for, the same things that you need to keep in mind outdoors for your fruits and vegetables. The light, the water, the nutrients, and the temperature are all gonna be vital to the success of your plant. And this second one here tends to be the area, no matter if you're inside or out, that people tend to have issues with. And I'm sure a lot of you can kind of relate to that, myself included. So light is something uh, that is easy to think of outdoors. You guys were already talking about having direct sunlight, and that's something that definitely carries over into the indoors too. Different plants are affected by different levels of intensity. And one of the really cool things about uh, being a part of Plant Hero and, and working through the winter months was really seeing how plants reacted to that winter solstice. Just having that little bit difference in light really did play into how healthy and how well the plants were doing inside. So being able to kind of pick up on that a little bit really does help in the end. So uh, whether you have curtains or tall trees, all of that does factor in the type of glass you have. Um, so there's a lot of things to think about with light that aren't really necessarily intuitive the first go around. So I think everyone knows that watering is something that plants need, but doing it correctly is its own art form, whether you're indoors or outdoors. So all plant roots need that oxygen in the soil. So if there's too much water, they're going to rot. And that's probably one of the number one things that we see, especially with some of the uh, plants that are tropical, but still like it a little bit on the dry side. And I'll definitely run through some plants with you that can be kind of watered to death and still survive, and ones that you don't really have to water very much at all. So you can kind of avoid this issue. So learning um, what the plant really needs water-wise is one of the, the easiest ways to have success. So using room temperature water is another tip I love to give people. Uh, cold water can shock roots. So you wanna make sure that you're using that room temperature water. A lot of plants, especially African violets and calitheas tend to be really the ones that we see issues with with that. Same with uh, the softened water. Um, and you do want to make sure you are draining the water out of those saucers too. And by the one of the most important ways you can ensure success is making sure that the pot that your plant is in has good drainage and a drainage hole. I know a lot of decorative planters that they sell, especially for smaller plants, don't actually have a hole in it. 
And that's something you can rectify on your own by just making a, a drilled hole in after the fact. So nutrition is another area that can uh, really play into whether or not you're going to have a healthy plant indoors. And fertilization is something that a lot of people struggle with, uh, myself included when I first got into this game, um, especially if you've been an outdoor gardener, this is one of those areas that's hard to kind of bring in. Uh, so all the same elements are equally as important indoors. All carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are going to be the essential elements that help plants grow. You can see from this diagram here too, uh, the different roots, uh, the roots and where the nutrients usually tend to lie and how they're uptaken. So for plants, the macro elements are the ones you're probably familiar with. Those are the ones that are going to show up on that fertilizer bag in those three letters across it, NPK. Nitrogen is really essential for growth, which is why it's always present in fertilizer. And phosphorus and potassium are kind of side players that really do a lot to promote overall greening as well as budding and fruiting. So those are the big ones. The secondary elements, your calcium, magnesium, and sulfur are still fairly important, particularly for things like tomatoes. Those are really going to be heavily needed by those. And the micros varies. Those of you guys who have palm trees, they're huge feeders on those micros. So a lot of times uh, deficiencies will display by discoloration in the leaves. You'll see especially uh, yellow streaking and brown ends on those palms that need that manganese and magnesium. So organic fertilizers and synthetic fertilizers are a little bit different. And so you'll see that on bags. So trying to, so for the difference for why you would want one over the other. Well, synthetic fertilizers do a great job of feeding the plant directly. Uh, so a lot of your liquid fertilizers that you get, like your miracle grows, are going to play into that. So they're going to go directly into the plant roots, as you can see here. Um, so the one risk with that is because it is so fast, it's very easy to overdo. Um, so a lot of times you'll end up burning your plant and you'll see that it'll literally look like it got burnt on the edges uh, with synthetic fertilizer. So that can be risky. Organic fertilizers are a lot gentler uh, because they actually go into the soil for a while and need to break down before the plant can actually take up those nutrients. So that's kind of the benefit of using an organic. It's slower and it bides your time so that you don't necessarily overdo it. Um, it's just an easier one to use. And you have to apply it less often. Oftentimes you only need to do it two times a year for indoor plants. So temperature in your home. So all of us are unique. We have unique plants, unique lives, and unique homes. I'm sure you guys have noticed going from room to room in your house can change the temperature. And this plays a big part in how happy your plants are going to be, especially once the heat kicks on or you have the AC on as well. Most house plants are like us, and they tend to like temperatures about 75 degrees and 65 degrees at night. Um, some of them do need cold in order to induce flowering, which explains why you might not see that indoors as much. Like if you do bring in an avocado tree, for instance, you're likely not going to see it flower. Um, you also want to make sure you're not placing them directly in the path of air vents or doors or by drafty windows for that reason. That can actually lower the temperature enough to make an unhappy plant. Other things to consider, uh, soil, the soil type you use, that can be really important for things like succulents. They're going to need something that drains really well, um, whereas other things are going to need something that has a little bit more of a nutrient bulk to it. So the humidity in your house, especially during these winter months, it's probably a little bit on the dry side, which isn't going to bode really well for a lot of our tropical plants. Um, so another thing to kind of keep in the, in the back of your mind there. So pests too, you would think that those would just be an outdoor thing, um, but because so many plants get moved in and out and you're going in and out, a lot of times you get some pest hitchhikers and you'll end up with things like mites especially and things like that. So always being on the lookout is important. And also root health. 
if your plant has been in a pot for a while, so we're talking more than a year or two, it might be at risk of being root bound. And you'll know that right away if you water the plants and it goes straight to the bottom. That means that it's, there's so many roots there that it's not even holding into that water at all. So in that case, it's going to need to be repotted. So these are things that you need to consider when you are working with your house plant. So as far as the soil goes, we do have some rec recommendations always. You want to make sure for indoor plants, you're using potting soil um, or for potting mix. Um, so there is a difference. Potting mixes often have aerators in them, which are the little white things that you see. That's perlite, and that's what makes the mix lighter. So aeration actually allows the plant to breathe and creates pockets in the soil where water can go and the plant roots can access. Vermiculite is similar to perlite. It's a little darker colored and it actually holds on to water. So you would definitely want that for a plant that needs more water and less watering. So coconut core, you might've seen this around. This is the same thing for those of you guys who have kids who have reptiles. This is the same stuff that they use as bedding. And it's great. Um, it degrades really slowly and it doesn't add any unwanted nutrients to your soil. And it's great for things that are, tend to be tricky to grow like orchids. It makes a lot of that aeration available to the roots so they're able to get oxygen and you can get it in a lot of different varieties. You can even buy this at the pet store if you want to. So if you're an orchid person or are planning to do orchids, this is definitely something to consider for your media. So can we go? Yes. I'm sorry. Where did you say you can get that? You can actually get it at pet stores, believe it or not. Oh, okay. Well, we don't have pets, so that's why I like I never seen that before. Yeah, yeah, because honestly, sometimes it can be hard to find. Um, you know, it's not something you can always just roll into like a Home Depot and find. Okay. But oddly enough, if you go over to Petco or PetSmart, there it'll be. So hanging out in the lizard section. So okay. it usually, you know, also has a, a moonlighting job as a bedding for those guys. And, and what did you say it was for? Did I put it in inside the pot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can actually use it as the, the growing media for things like orchids. Okay. Is it only for orchid or for all kinds of plants? Oh, you can use it for a lot of stuff. You can kind of even create your own mix if you're kind of more of a DIY fan. Um, and you can mix, mix the coconut core with a little bit of the perlite, with a little bit of potting mix, with sand um, to kind of create a nice light mix for things that are going to not necessarily need a lot of amendment in their soil, but need a lot of drainage. Okay. So it would also work well for um, your aeroids. So for your things like um, your air myths and your peace lilies, uh, African violets, things like that. So all of these are indoor plants that you mentioned, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Amanda, there's a question from Gita. Um, she's, she'd love to have one at work, but hasn't been successful in keeping them happy and healthy. Um, do you have any tips on how to keep orchids uh, happy? Yeah, and seriously, orchids need their own class, which I hope that we do in the future, offer classes on just specific plants because yeah. orchids are a struggle. Honestly, I kind of gave up on orchids and, and you know just started throwing them outside. And of course, then they bloomed. Um, I'm in Florida. Uh, but since then, I've really taken a liking to them and kind of realized that uh, there are some tricks to doing them inside and humidity is and aeration around them is usually the, the key and having them in an office space is tricky for that. Offices tend to be dry. Um, so if you have the ability and the, the time and that's difficult because sometimes in offices you're not always there to spray them every so often that makes a big difference. Honestly, I keep a lot of orchids in my bathroom, which sounds ridiculous, but they love the steam from the shower. Uh, that really makes them happy. Um, I don't water them very much. That also makes them happy. Uh, so really just keeping the water light, keeping um, their, their soil on a minimum. I just keep them in coconut core, nothing else. Um, usually in just one of those little baskets so that they can kind of have their roots out and free. Um, 
uh, the less you do with them, the happier they tend to be. That's been my experience. Thanks, Amanda. One quick follow up to that. When you say you spray the plant, do you like just spray directly at it? Do you spray the coconut husk? Sorry, I'm going to get really specific because I'm really trying to have, have a, like, a cheerful plant on my desk. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So kind of all over. So I definitely okay. um, miss the, the top portion. So where the leaves are, as well as where the, the blooms are, if they happen to have them, and a little bit on the medium as well. Okay. Great, From thank you. Yep. Yeah. So um, we, we did mention perlite too. So it's actually volcanic, which always blows my mind but it's great because it does um, add that aeration to the soil, which is why you almost always see it in potting mix. So vermiculite again, looks very, very similar, but very different. So you definitely don't wanna mix these up. Um, they actually hold water. So this is something you would wanna add if you were trying to grow something that needed a lot of moisture. So here's the difference between the two. So vermiculite is a little bit bigger and perlite is smaller and whiter. So for do you, you yep, go ahead. Do you buy these separately and then just kind of make your own mix when you are you know, starting something or you want to kind of transplant your plant to a new pot? Yeah, that's a great question. And to be honest with you, yes, I do. Um, I, especially for houseplants, it's hard to find a really good potting mix that I, I love. So I usually make one that's specific for different plants. Um, and again, especially succulents and cacti, they are really, really picky sometimes about what they, what they need. Um, orchids as well. Um, and it's more cost effective if you buy these things in bulk and then make your own mix versus buying um, the pre-made stuff you get at the, the garden center. Um, so you can, uh, the ratios vary. There's a lot of really great uh, recipes, if you will, online for, for different plant types. I'm happy to as well, if you're interested, I can send you my recipe for basic house plants as well, but it's kind of equal parts of a couple of different things, including um, the perlite for sure. I yeah, know, happy to get more information. I think we just spent all of last year trying out so many different like you know, package just out of Home Depot or whatever was easily accessible. And like, I don't think we were getting anywhere with that. So yeah, I would love to hear, I'd love to get that information. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think a lot of the ones that you buy um, tend to be a little bit too rich, a little heavy for, for an indoor plant. Mm -hmm. So as far as humidity goes, again, for the houses, your house is probably not as humid as plants like. So, um, and this is another one that varies room to room wherever you go. So if it's too humid, you'll know because you'll get a lot of mold growth um, and humid conditions also invite the presence of a lot of pests. So this is definitely a problem for me, both indoors and outdoors. Um, I have a really old home from the 1940s. And then on top of that, I live in Florida. So it actually is pretty humid inside my house as well. Um, so you do have to watch out for that um, a lot more. So for most people, they're not going to have to necessarily worry about this uh, indoors. But if you are growing things outdoors, remember that air circulation is important. So keeping your plants well trimmed and spaced uh, does help a lot with reducing pests and fungal pressure because that increases in humidity for sure. Again, just to talk a little bit about fungus, this is some of the symptoms of that. So above is root rot. So obviously you're not gonna see that necessarily um, on the plant itself, but what you will see is the picture below it. Oftentimes these are the symptoms that are displayed by having roots that look like the picture above. So, and every plant kind of displays it differently, which is part of the challenge, but you'll probably note here that it's got some brown tips and it's got some leaves that are very discolored and wilting. Does anybody else notice anything going on here? Is it super crowded? What was that? Is it crowded? 
Yeah, it's, it is kind of looking a little bit full there. So it's possible that this one is probably root bound as well. Um, but yeah, you can see that everything is drooping. So it is also giving it the appearance of being very full, but definitely some reduced color going on the brown tips and this overall wilty appearance. So if you see that, I would be suspecting that even though wilt we kind of associate with being maybe too dry, it's probably too wet here. So powdery mildew is another one. And those of you guys growing vegetables outdoors probably already know this very well. Um, powdery mildew pops up all over the place, especially when humidity comes in the summertime. And believe it or not, plants can get this indoors as well. Um, so you'll see this more commonly on succulents. If anybody has those flapjack style succulents, they, for whatever reason, powdery mildew just loves those things. And usually it'll be at the base, although here you're seeing it on the leaves as well. And hence the name, it does look like powder. And oftentimes you can scrape this off with your finger now. So this is a really easy one to treat with just a really basic fungicide, but honestly, a lot of times you can just take care of it on your own with a wet paper towel. So is this the same thing that kind of also uh, comes on tomato plants? Because that's what we noticed. Yes. Okay, All yeah, so it's the same. Okay. Yes. So just yes. you're just saying just wipe it down. Like we try to treat it with some, I don't know, some pesticide. Yeah, you can treat it as well. Um, so it, it might also be, and I'd love to see a picture too at some point if you want to send them to me. Um, oh, sure. If it's not powdery mildew, it could potentially be a bug, believe it or not. It could be a, um, a mealy bug, which kind of has that same fuzzy appearance and doesn't really move very much. Um, and, and those love tomatoes as well, but they kind of equally love tomatoes. Powdery mildew just loves all the vegetables. Um, if any of you guys are growing the brassicas like the cauliflower and the broccoli, you're gonna see it there too. And that's an easy one to treat as well if you wanted to just use a fungicide. A good recommendation for fungicide for especially for outdoor vegetables is called garden friendly fungicide. This is something that is a bacteria that is not harmful to people, pets, or the environment. So it's safe to use on edibles, which not a lot of fungicides are. So definitely recommend picking that one up. And that's one you can get on Amazon if you have trouble finding it at the big box stores. So garden friendly fungicide. Um, it, I use it on indoor plants too. Um, it's safe, it's easy to use, pretty effective. Sorry, was there a specific name or type of that garden friendly fungicide? That's actually the name. Oh, okay, thank you, that's easy. Yep, and for vegetables, it'll tell you on the label to use, I think one teaspoon, go ahead and use a tablespoon. Um, I, I, there's better success when you use a tablespoon of it rather than just the teaspoon when you're mixing it with a gallon of water. So use a little bit more than what it's called for. So you can also use that on um, what's going on on this slide as well, which is leaf spot, depending on whether it's bacterial or fungal. Um, these guys are fungal. So you would also be able to use that on um, this as well, especially out in the garden. So some tips to overall increase the likelihood that you'll end up with plants that don't die. Um, buy resistant plants. So there are plants and varieties out there that are less susceptible to fungus, um, especially with tomatoes. You'll see a bunch of little tiny letters next to the tomato label when you buy them. And a lot of times that's telling you that it's resistant to certain viruses or funguses. Um, there's a lot of interesting cultivars out there now uh, that have resistance to these diseases. So that will help you right off the bat. Um, keeping them dry. Um, so you want to make sure that you're watering them gently and infrequently. So increasing air circulation also helps a lot. So you can do that with a fan or just by spacing your plants a distance apart. So regularly pruning them as well will also help keep them so that they are getting the maximum amount of airflow. So for the pest part, um, and I'll show mealybug, I believe here in a second too, to kind of uh, help you make that identification. But white fly, has anybody seen these before? 
Wouldn't that be pretty that. small? Sorry. Yeah, I don't think so. Go, go for it. Yeah, so these guys are super obnoxious and really hard to get rid of, um, especially if you do end up with these guys outdoors. You, they do come indoors as well, um, and they love vegetables and pretty much any ornamental plant. So uh, they have a very, very fast life cycle, hard to get rid of. So the best way to get um, rid of these guys, unfortunately, is by hand control, um, just mechanically removing them. Again, uh, hitting them with a, a, the hose if you're outside or just uh, using a washcloth if you're able. There's really not a lot of great pesticides for them anymore uh, because they have um, such a quick turnaround in their life cycle. They've developed a resistance to most of our available pesticides. So that's been really tough. Amanda, I have a question. What causes white flies to appear uh, on a plant? In the first place. That is a fantastic question. So here's the thing with bugs, you guys. Bugs are really lazy, so they're not going to attack a healthy plant. They're interested in the wheat gazelle of the herd, so they're going to go after something that's already not doing so great. So typically that's the reasons that they're especially on your outside plants. For your inside plants, generally um, they're either there because they came with the plant, they hitchhiked from where you purchased it from. Um, that's usually the number one reason you would have it. Um, otherwise, if you move your plant indoors and bring it you know, in for the winter and it lives mostly outside during the, the warmer months, that's another way you can get it. Their eggs are teeny, teeny, tiny too. So you might not know that they're there until you actually see them as an adult. They're very tiny too, especially these next guys here, scale, um, which I'm sure most of you guys have had, especially outdoors. But these guys like to hide on the undersides of leaves. So oftentimes you won't even notice they're there. Um, they look like scales, little scales, um, and they don't move as adults. They actually don't have feet. So they're not fast moving. So oftentimes they'll look like a blemish on the leaf instead of an actual bug. Super tiny. They're only a couple millimeters in length. Um, usually the reason people notice them is because they'll see ants. Ants will actually farm these guys because they make this, this uh, sticky substance. And if you have that sticky substance, usually it is accompanied by black sooty mold, especially if you're outside. So all these things, this little ecosystem is created on your plant by this bug. Um, so, and what they're doing is they're actually sucking the juices out of the leaves. So they're definitely not something that you want. And the other side of the leaf oftentimes will reflect that by having a yellow discoloration. So here's the mealy bugs I was talking about. So sometimes you can mistake this for powdery mildew uh, because they do have that powdery appearance. The difference in the way to really tell them apart is these guys do move, whereas powdery mildew won't. Um, and this tends to be higher up on the plant, whereas powdery mildew tends to be more apparent at the base. So these are a type of scale, but they're more mobile um, and they're fuzzy, hence their name. And they also have a very fast turnaround. So we're talking about 14 days. They go from egg to adult. So you can actually have quite a few of these on your plant. Amanda, before you uh, hop to the next one, um, I just want to let everybody know that Amanda actually took, do you mind going back? Oh, sure. Amanda, am I correct in saying that you took the photo of the mealybug through the microscope? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool to mention. So obviously these are super tiny. Can you describe how you were even able to capture this on a, on a picture? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have a little side hustle outside of this side hustle, um, uh, testing soil. So one of the things I look for in soil for, for customers is uh, the microorganisms that are present in the soil, because that tells you a lot about uh, what you have going on in your yard um, in terms of you know, the beneficial bacteria and fungi and microbes that you wanna see. So I have a microscope camera that can capture things that small. So a mealybug is actually not that tiny for, for that camera. So I just put this guy underneath that camera and was able to, to capture this. An impressive photo, Amanda. Yeah, so cool. 
So this guy is an aphid. Um, you guys have probably also been familiar with this one. It's another one that uh, it creates a sticky, sticky sap that attracts a lot of ants. And these guys also hop around a lot more. Um, they love tomatoes. They love all the vegetables and all the herbs. They also love your house plants. Um, they're fairly easy to remove, especially if you're outside. So you can just uh, hit those with a hose and call it a day. It's very satisfying. So these guys you won't see very well. And oftentimes they're sneaky and they'll hang out in the soil. So if you move plants in and out, a lot of times you'll have them. Um, you'll notice they're damaged because it's almost like they went at your leaf like with a cheese grater because that's what their mouth looks like. So you'll have a leaf that's kind of half partially chewed through and it'll look like almost a window pane kind of damage. So you'll get those every so often. So gnats are one of the more common ones that we do see and they love moist soil. And a lot of times they will be kind of feeding on fungus that grows in the soil. So they look a lot like fruit flies and they're not great flyers, so they'll just be kind of hanging out at the soil level in your plants. And, tip, and typically you'll have that either because your plant was outside and you brought it in, or it was already in soil that you got from the nursery you bought your plant from. Um, there's a lot of different reasons you could have them. Easiest way is just to repot your plant and get rid of it. But I know, Anker, you found something really cool to get rid of fungal gnats, if I recall. Yeah, there's... um. There's two things you can do with gnats because you've got the adults, which look like this, that fly around are incredibly annoying. Um, there's a product on Amazon that's pretty cheap. It's called Catchy, K-A-T-C-H-Y. And it's essentially like a vacuum fan with uh, like a UV light that attracts the adult gnats in. And then the vacuum kind of sucks it into a sticky tape. So it kind of, it doesn't have, you might see some of these yellow sticky tapes that folks use. And if you don't want to put that into your houseplants, and have stuck gnats everywhere, this machine kind of sucks them in. So that's a really good way of taking care of the adults. And then there's also a product called Root Cleaner. And what Root Cleaner does, it's, uh, it's a liquid that goes through the soil and it's harmless to the plants, but it will uh, end up killing the eggs of the gnats um, that are in the soil. So if you only take care of the adults, you're not going to treat the problem because those eggs are going to hatch and the gnats are going to come back the next year, uh, the next couple of weeks. So you want to make sure you treat the issue both at the, the egg level and the adult level. And that's using catchy for the adults and root cleaner for the eggs. Yeah, absolutely. And that's an important thing to note. All insects have those multiple life cycles. And most of them have something to do with the plant itself too. But finding the one that is the most damaging is the, is the best way to remedy the situation. One, one of the ways that we've also seen um, gnats disappear is simply by moving, if, if it's to do with houseplants, is moving the houseplant outside. Mm -hmm. um, that, that seems to have cleared up some of the gnat problems with we, which we've seen with our customers too. So it's kind of an easier solution, but it might take some more time to do properly. So this guy here is actually not an insect, even though it looks like it. Mites are arachnids, so they're more closely related to spiders, but they're equally annoying. Um, you really need a magnifying glass to look at these guys. Spider mites are red, and so they're a little bit more noticeable, but they'll usually be hanging out on the bottom of your leaves, and usually their telltale is that they'll leave behind some um, webbing, just like a spider. So if you see that on your plant, it's a good chance, if you don't have a spider there, that you have spider mites, which are not good because they're feeding on your plants. So these are another one that's, that's fairly tough um, to get rid of uh, because a lot of pesticides aren't great for mites because they're not insects. So they need either an arachnicide, which there aren't very many of, and not super safe to apply in the home. So uh, using a soap-based treatment or an oil-based treatment is usually the best way to actually get, get these guys gone quickly. And that works pretty well for a lot of the pests we just talked about tonight. Um, you could use a soap base or a, um, 
or an oil-based treatment. The trick is to hit the insects or the mites as directly as possible um, and not have that actually sit on the surface of the leaf. Because in that case, it'll actually be doing the action it's going to do to the bug that you want, suffocate it out. You can actually suffocate out the leaves if you just leave um, oil or soap on there directly. So a couple of tips to avoid infestation. Inspect the plant before you buy it. Make sure you look at it really well before you put it into your car and take it home to make sure that there aren't hitchhikers. Using clean pots and potting soil, making sure if you are reusing potting soil that there aren't any hitchhikers in there. So removing any potential pests from the actual soil ball of the plant is another important one. And isolating your plant from the other plants for a few days to a couple of weeks. And especially not letting the plant's leaves touch the leaves of your newer plants. Another tip that's not on here, um, that's just good form all around. If you are pruning your plants, and this is outside or inside, it's not a bad idea to dip them in alcohol between plants. That way you're not potentially spreading anything from one to the other. So root health. So healthy roots are really important for a healthy plant. And you wanna make sure that they're developing a root system that's, that is healthy and it's not too big for the container like you're seeing here. So our best remedy for that is repotting. And so many people are gonna be repotting their plants in March, which is the appropriate time to do so because that is when your plant is actively growing. So when you replant it and repot it, it's a little bit stressful for the plant moving into a new home. So when you do it when it's actively growing, it gives it time to recover from that shock. So symptoms, we talked about a little bit by looking at the picture um, a while back, but they look a lot like under and over watering. Uh, as you guys noted, it was wilting. That was the big, the big one, which can also mean that it's underwater. So to truly tell, you have to get a look at the roots. So in order to do this, you will need to remove the plant from its pot. And believe me, if it's root bound, it'll kind of come up a little bit more easy than you expected, which is also a good sign. So if it's only a little bit root bound, it'll come out of the container easily. But if it's badly root bound, it might have trouble being removed from the container. And then, sometimes- oh, yeah, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, and sometimes, especially if you have holes in the bottom of your planter, you'll actually see the roots coming through the holes of the plant of the planter. Awesome. I, I know we've got about like 13 minutes to go. And so I just wanted to pause real quick to see if anybody had any questions come up that we could answer on some of the stuff that we've been covering, or even if it's unrelated as well. A quick question, Amanda, on the, you know, on the spider mites. I feel like we have seen some or lots of them outside. And you mentioned a soap-based or an oil-based solution. I was wondering if you had like a DIY recipe for that that you could share. Yes, and honestly, I'm so glad you brought that up because there's a lot of questionable stuff on the internet in terms of um, DIY uh, insecticides. So one myth I really wanna bust right now is um, dishwashing soap. I know so many recipes call for Dawn please don't use Dawn. Um, it has degreasers in it. So that'll slip right off the bug or the mite or your leaf. Um, so it's not the right uh, fatty phosphate blend that is needed to adhere to the insect or the mite, which is what you want. All those guys have spiracles on the side of their body, which is how they breathe. So by applying a soap, you want it to stick to it. So it's going to suffocate it out. So any um, soap uh, like a... Uh, even a bar soap would work, but baby shampoo is actually one of the best and easiest and cheapest. So if you have access to baby shampoo, that's one of your, the, a good one. And really you just mix that equal parts in water and you, you've got your, your soap spray, simple as that. Um, another one you can use for oil, actually mineral oil is a great one. Um, you can just mix that with a little bit of water so it's sprayable. You wouldn't believe if you actually go to the like Home Depot, a lot of the um, oil sprays, that's what they are. They're, they're mineral oil based. Another popular one to be careful with is neem oil. I find that neem oil is not very effective on mites. Um, so you might wanna hold off on that. 
What neem oil is really good for is rust, which is a fungal issue. So I've seen a lot of good success with that. Um, but uh, do be careful about using neem for mites. I even read a recent publication that suggested that neem oil actually causes mites to procreate. So definitely not something you wanna encourage. I can certify that we tried neem oil last year. <laughs> yeah. So you can say we, we, we spend a lot of time at Home Depot. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But I'm a big fan of using the soap just because it tends to be a lot more effective and you can use it for just about anything. So what I'm gonna kind of close with today is um, the different types of houseplants and which ones are the right ones for you. So if you're looking for one that's gonna, if especially for offices, if you're looking for something that's gonna create a lot of oxygen, some plants are better than others. So spider plants have great research into being excellent oxygen producers. Snake plants of all things, which, you know, looking at them, you really wouldn't think that, but they put out a lot of oxygen. They also happen to be one of the easiest ones to take care of, so that's a great one. ZZ plant, another super easy one to find, um, and that one is a great oxygen producer, as well as Dracaena. So these guys are easy to find houseplants that produce a lot of oxygen for your home. So if you're in a situation where you really don't have a lot of light, or if you really don't honestly know what kind of light you have, um, aim on the low side and start with one of these. So this is the ZZ plant here. I love this one. Um, I have them in about every color that they come in and I have had great success. And honestly, there's some that I have forgotten about because they're in the back room um, and they're still alive. So especially if you have a black thumb, quote unquote, this is a good one for you. Really low water requirements too. Pothos, uh, which I have behind me here, there, there's so many colors. There's a pothos for everyone and so many varieties. I also have a pink one behind me too. Um, these are super easy. Uh, they don't love low light, but they'll adapt to it. So maiden hair ferns are another one. Uh, just be careful with watering with that one. It has, it's, you know, very Goldilocks in terms of its likes with water. Chinese evergreen is another popular one that can do really well in low light. So if you have a drafty house, um, my house is pretty drafty. Uh, there are some plants that are going to do well for you there too. Uh, jade, which is a type of succulent is perfect as is Christmas cactus, which really I think should just be an all around cactus all the year. Um, it's great and probably pretty underrated. So the Hoya, which is pictured here, um, that one has become very, very popular. I've seen cuttings of Hoyas go for as much as $300 on Etsy. So they're kind of having a moment. And you can see why by looking at this flower, they have some pretty incredible flowers when they actually do it. So if you have a dry home, um, or if you're not really sure on the humidity portion of it, or don't want to have to worry about humidity, these are the ones for you. So again, philodendrons. So that is going to include all kinds of different plants, including everybody's favorite monsteria. Uh, succulents, again, are going to love your dry home. Fiddle leaf figs, like it a little bit more on the dry side. Sansevera, which is your snake plant, also going to do well as are your aloes and your cacti. And this guy here in the picture is a rubber tree. And this is a really pretty variegated one, but they come in a lot of colors as well now. And where can we buy one that looks like that? That looks like this one? Yeah. So this one actually um, was raised or I guess grown by one of my friends, Seth Rhodes of Rhodes Roots. Um, he grows uh, variegated rubber plants as well as uh, the pink philodendron behind me and all That's kinds of fun house plants. Does he ship these countrywide? He should. I'll, I'll talk to him about it. I would love to buy one of these. I it's beautiful. And so yeah, they're and rubber trees are beautiful plants. So yeah, elephant ears too um, does a lot of those. So I agree. Rubber tree plants are also great uh, for beginners, I think as well. So yeah, they look stunning. the ones that are, you know, if you really are 
convinced that you're going to kill it, um, I recommend one of these plants. These are the plants of steel, meaning that they're pretty impossible to kill. You can set it and forget it just about. Um, spider plants, pending that you remember to water them and they're getting enough light, uh, they're probably not going to die. Snake plants, I probably haven't watered the snake plant behind me for months. Um, I don't know, an embarrassing amount of time, uh, and it's still here. Um, ZZ plants, those are also really easy, and cycads. So if you have an opportunity to get a cycad, um, a lot of those kind of masquerade as palms or sold as palms, even though they are cycads. So now on to the troublemakers. These are the ones you should avoid if you're a first time plant owner or you are really sure you're not going to do well. <laughs> um, make, your, you know, make sure that these are not in your cart. So fiddle leaf fig, which I know is incredibly popular right now because it's gorgeous, um, but it's probably, I think, um, the one that we get majority of our calls about. Um, and for, I also moonlight at a retail center um, as well. And at our nursery, this is the most returned plant for a reason. It's hard. You move it just a little bit and it drops all its leaves. You change the lighting, it'll drop all of its leaves. It's just the most finicky plant. Um, people who get into these guys though, the ficus and love them um, tend to be really good with them. So, um, but if you're trying to avoid a plant or you're just starting out into the world of house plants, this is definitely one to keep off the list. Same with lady palms, uh, birds of paradise can also be finicky indoors. Um, and ferns. Ferns, that, aside from the maiden hair, are pretty tough to do, especially with their watering requirements. So uh, finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about propagating houseplants, uh, just because I, this is always something I get a lot of questions about. So really quick, I'm just going to go through a couple of the ways you can propagate. Um, and this goes for outside plants too. Coleus especially is really popular outdoors. I have one right here. Um, so this one is super easy to take a cutting from. All you have to do is seriously snap it off and then stick it into water or even dirt and you're fine. Um, it'll grow roots, which is awesome. If, and pretty much a lot, all plants can be done through cutting, whether it's the pothos behind me, the coleus from outdoors, even um, certain uh, fruiting plants as well. So with these guys, you just want to use about three to five inches. Again, it really does not matter. So the higher percentage of the cuttings are going to root and they will do so pretty quickly. Very fast turnaround. So one of you were talking about how you love to use uh, spent produce and, and repurpose it in the garden. Oh my gosh, underground stems um, are perfect for that. So potatoes are actually a stem. Um, and they do make those eyes. You can easily just cut off those eyes and regrow them, simple as that. There's a lot of other things you can do with that as well. Um, outside of the world of potatoes, turmeric is definitely having a moment in, in the health food circles. And that's something you can easily regrow as well. Um, those uh, stems will make eyes uh, just like the potato and you can cut those off and grow them as well. Um, so you can regrow turmeric as well as ginger. So leaf cuttings, there are some plants that will go just from leaves. Uh, Sansevieria or your snake plant is one and you would just cut it like that and just put it into a simple media. Another one that's really easy to do is African violet. Actually, I have here probably the easiest of all to do. I don't know if you can see that too well, but this is actually a succulent. You can see that it's starting to already bud that way. And all I did was just drop the leaves from this jade plant on top of the soil and you can see it's already starting to grow more jade plants. Succulents are probably the most easiest thing to do in the world. And it's, you know, I'll be honest, a lot of times I'll walk through a Home Depot and accidentally, accidentally knock some of the leaves off the succulents and take them home and get free plants. So that's really the, the goal with propagation. It's just making free plants from plants that you already have. So layering is another one, and I'd love to eventually do a class just on the different styles of propagation, as once you get really into houseplants, uh, you can make a whole lot of houseplants pretty quick. 
um, through these methods. Layering is one of the trickier ones, but this is something you can do, especially for those ficus trees and um, the pothos that we talked about earlier. Division is the simplest. If you guys happen to have spider plants, this is the easiest thing in the world. Um, they have those little spider babies that come down and those are gonna give you more plants. And all you have to do is divide them out. So one thing I also wanted to mention is the difference between the rooting hormones. Um, you'll have a lot more success, especially with cuttings, if you use a rooting hormone. And there's two different things you can use. You can use the rooting powder that's pictured here. My personal favorite is this guy here, which is Dip and Grow. It's a liquid. It's, you can buy this pretty much everywhere. It's great. Um, and all you have to do is, as the name suggests, you just dip it in and stick it into the soil and you've got your, you're all set. Rooting powder can be a little bit trickier to use and oftentimes will burn uh, the plant. So it's definitely good, but it takes some time to get used to. So again, with uh, the tips and tricks, uh, do remember that rooting hormone is hazardous in large amounts. So you want to err on the side of using a small amount when you are using it. Um, and liquid is definitely going to be your friend if you're doing anything remotely hardwood oriented. So that goes for things like roses even that are technically semi-hardy and even tomatoes definitely are gonna need to use that. All right, so um, I am at the end of my, my presentation and I would love to hear more about your plants and what you have going on in your homes and your gardens. So do you guys have any questions for me or any stories you wanna share about your own gardening experience? Amanda, do you have any suggestions for us to, you know, sort of, uh, now that we are coming up to spring season, you know, generally what the weather is like in the Bay Area, like, uh, you know, any plants that we should like look out for, or you know, if you have a suggestion there. Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, and it's a relevant one too, since we are kind of, March is such a, a dicey time, but that's usually when stuff starts really happening outside. Um, some tips going in with that, uh, that's a great time to start for you guys planting your uh, seeds if you have any. Um, make sure you're reading the labels with when to plant and so forth, same with your seedlings and starting your garden. Remember all the spacing rules and so forth, making sure that you are spacing them out accordingly to make sure they are getting that airflow. Um, bugs are going to start coming in, in droves uh, about April, May, so you definitely want to watch out for those guys. And if, making sure that you're selecting good plants from the get-go is really going to be super helpful for you. And paying attention to those frost dates as well. Um, usually March is, is pretty well set and it's a good starting point, but definitely keep that in mind. Amanda, Connie has a question. Connie, would you like to just ask Amanda or would you like me to... Do you prefer for me to read it out? I wasn't sure. sure. I just want to type it before I forget. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was saying that we have a lemon tree, and then this year all the fruit is about like a quarter percent less than smaller than before. So mm -hmm. uh, um, we don't do too much. We don't we don't fertilize. We don't we just water a lot of times with the <laughs> with the rainwater, but um, they it seems to just grow so. Um, yeah. not sure what's going on. So, um, I mean, this is one I'd love to see a picture of too. So for the lemons themselves though, I know it's less production, but are the lemons looking the same as they normally do or are they different in the size and the texture? Um, it's mostly the size. So, um, we obviously didn't save any from before, but, um, this year does just like baby tiny and then they would just stop growing but we um so that was we got one kind of cycle and then now all of them kind of are gone and now they're growing again so the flowering right now mm -hmm. interesting and the leaves are the leaves looking nice and um that robust green are you seeing some yellowing on the leaves um not that i recall they look i <sighs> I, I usually just pay attention to the fruit. 
I'm not quite sure if there's any difference. So we have another plant which is the peach plant and that tree definitely the leaves are has been um, curling up for a couple of years but then the fruit's been the same mm -hmm. but then the lemon tree I don't think it's any different because I think we would have noticed that so I think I already know the answer to this but have you pruned your lemon tree ever no <laughs> so that might be one aspect okay this okay. is all from not seeing it. Um, but that really helps a lot with the, the ability to hang on to fruit and also having larger fruit. Um, a lot of those fruit trees, once they, they really bush out, they need um, some of those limbs removed at, in order to create that aeration and to also kind of drive that energy back into producing fruit rather than just growing more leaves from all those stems. So right now it's probably okay. working harder in other places rather than the place it should be, which is your fruit. Okay. Um, and fertilizing, that's something I would definitely recommend um, for anything fruiting. Uh, there's a couple of really good uh, organic citrus fertilizers. Um, I really like Epsoma, which is a national brand. That's E-S-P-O-M-A. They make a, a product called Citrus Tone. Um, and even though it's citrus, you can use it on your peach tree too. I, it's, it's all the same stuff. I mean, that's the big secret, guys. Like most uh, fruit fertilizers are good for most fruit. There are a couple of exceptions. Um, but I would use that and apply it um, once every three to six months. Um, and see if that makes a difference. It generally probably should, especially um, given it'll have more of that, that phosphorus and potassium it needs for fruiting. Great, thank you. What kind of, do you know what kind of peach and lemon you have? Just out of curiosity. Um, so the lemon, it's, I only know Meyer and not Meyer and that one's the not Meyer tree. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much helpful, how helpful is that? Um, and then uh, the peach is yellow peach. Okay. I don't know if there's more different types of peaches other than oh, the color. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. About as many peaches as there are apple varieties. Wow. Um, one more information on that. There's a fantastic blog um, that that UGA puts out where they have um, a, a guy who does all the varieties of peaches and a big tasting of all the peaches and has all the details about which variety, you know, has more of a, a chin drip effect than the others and, and all of that. Wow. Um, but yeah, there's, there's hundreds of yellow and then hundreds of white. Wow. Yeah, they just no idea. <laughs> that, you know, they, they don't sit in the grocery store very well. So it's much easier just to label them as yellow or white uh, rather than go through all the varieties. But just like how Apple has, you know, um, Pink Lady and Granny Smith, there's, you know, the White Queen. And here we have the Florida Prince and um, the Snow Peach and, you know, all of that. So um, there's, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of names for just about every fruit. Okay. We've tried many times to grow um, avocados, mm -hmm. but we've been killing them. <laughs> we buy them like from, um, that's already, a, I guess, a seedling, a small seedling. Mm -hmm. We've killed that. We've tried from the seed, which we germinated I guess but it just and then we also inherited some friends who had some success where it was growing but then I have no idea what to do I just killed them all so it's not just you avocados are kind of tricky um, and I'm jealous because even though we can grow oh 40 different varieties of um, avocados in Florida we cannot grow the Haas avocado that you eat in the grocery store because we are too wet um, and you are dry enough to be able to. So that just kind of gave away the secret with avocados. Um, the, a lot of them especially the Mexican kind that you guys get and grow 
um, they, they need to be dry. Um, so for instance, in my yard, I have mounds created because there's no topography in Florida, just so I can grow avocados. Um, they need to be up and they need. Are you still there? I think Amanda oh. might've dropped off for a second there. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> She'll be like, back. I see her. Yeah, I think maybe just a connection. Yeah. Amanda, you, you're dropped off for a bit. Oh, interesting. Can you hear me now though? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so definitely keep it raised and, and keep it uh, pretty dry. Uh, they do not like to have, to use a horticultural term, wet feet. <laughs> There's also a specific, um, mix with the soil. Um, I know Ian, Ian was recommending a certain mix of it, so we can try to find out what that was as well to help uh, avocados grow successfully. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's part of it as well, uh, and kind of why they struggle to grow into like a mature stage. Um, I'll check in with Ian as well to find out what that mix was. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's definitely not just you. Avocados are tricky. Okay. And then the, we have a vegetable that is, um, I think it's a spinach variety. Mm -hmm. um, so it's one that I we ate and then I was trying to save the ends of and, and trying to grow it out. But it's been eaten a lot, I think. So I, I don't know if it's dried off or it's, it looks like it's been eaten but I don't see any bugs and they're small. Like the leaves are really small. Mm -hmm. um, so what could we do about that? Honey, is there any chance you could uh, give us some sort of a video feed on this plant? <laughs> um, or is it, well, I'm assuming it's too dark there right now, right? Yeah, it's super dark and it's outside. Um, it's a dark leafy, green um so but then so like i i don't have a lot of space and so i've been putting a lot of different things in the same pot and stuff but that would be the only one that is being eaten and the other ones are growing like i would have the green onions in the same pot and the green onions mm -hmm. are fine but then the um that other variety of spinach is just being eaten and it's growing it doesn't look like what it would look like from when I uh, buy it from the store either. Actually, I got it from, I got this from, I usually go to the farmer's market. Um, and I actually, that that type of spinach, I don't see a lot in the, uh, the stores. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason why I go to the farmer's market also. So I wonder what could I do? So it's growing and um, so it's growing. Usually when I buy from the farmer's market, it has maybe four, five, six to a bunch. And then it would, um, it, and then it would end in like uh, the lettuce head kind of thing. And then um, when I, I'm growing in my backyard, it's growing much fuller. So mm -hmm. in the bunch is growing quite full, but then it's being eaten. Yeah, so can you describe what the um, damage looks like? Is it like it's literally gone or is it just uh, like a bite, like a small bite? Um, so the leaf would be eaten so much that it's almost a whole leaf is gone. And then so the middle is keep on growing. And so the middle keeps on growing and the sides are being eaten. So the, the leaves on the side, outside are being eaten. So it's almost gone. Like I don't really see too much of the green portion of it, but then in the middle, it still keeps on growing. And so the middle still is green, but then when it gets to the outside it, and then it grows bigger, it gets eaten. Does that make sense? So when you see stuff like that, where so much of the leaf is taken, either there's a couple of suspects to kind of add to your list. Of course, this is without me seeing it, but rabbits are famous for that. And they're picky about what they eat, believe it or not. Um, snails. Snails are also big fans of spinach. Um, and grasshoppers will kind of just take a leaf and kind of shred it. 
So those are your, your three suspects, I would say, at this point, without being able to see it. This is in my backyard. My backyard is really small, but I guess rabbits can come through. And grasshopper? I've never seen that. Early, any... early. Say that again, sorry. They're out early, early in the morning. Okay. And then they don't touch the other plants? I guess maybe they just like that one? <laughs> okay. Yeah, bugs are funny like that. Uh, I just wanted to see if Melanie or Sean or Liz had any questions too. Yeah, please. Um, we haven't heard from them, but maybe, maybe they don't have questions. I just wanted to check before we ended up closing off the, the session. Yeah, thank you. I had a quick question about those lucky bamboo, Chinese bamboos that they sell in supermarkets. Um, they're always just in water, no soil. Is that sustainable? Do I need to migrate them to a different kind of vessel or soil base? Yeah, that is a great question. So I've actually done both. Um, I've kept them in the water and they've lived for a good while. And I've also replanted them into soil and they've lived a good while. Um, the, again, the thing is though, like once you have, they do, moisture is a hard thing with those as well um, to kind of get right. So Ankur, do you have any experience with just water growing them for any sustained amount of time? Because each time I've kept them in the water, I've not done that for more than six months. Yeah, I, I have not, not specifically with bamboos, but I know that once you kind of have these plants rooting in one source like water, it, it's going to be really hard for them to transition beyond like six months to the next. So I think my, my advice there would be to like transition if you, it, I think it comes to a personal preference, but then you kind of want to stick with that medium um, for, for the long haul. And when you move them to soil, did they grow bigger or kind of retain the same size and shape? No, it grew bigger. Um, it kind of lost that size uh, and the shape to it. Um, a lot of times what you don't see behind the scenes there is that it's kind of manicured to be that way. So yeah. if you're not doing that on your end, it's going to kind of lose that over time. OK, thank you. Melanie or Sean, any, any questions on anything we've covered or any plant questions at all that we can help you with? She just left a note in the chat, she's still. Oh, sure, okay. Okay, cool. Um, okay, well, I know we were like about an hour and <laughs> 20 minutes over. Um, thank you, Amanda, for teaching this class. There was a really informative and there was a lot there. Um, thank you everyone for joining. We'll send out, um, well, I guess you have the recording, Connie, so you've got yes. that with you. Um, I'll check in on the avocado tree as well to see like what, what the recommendations were from Ian. Um, and then I know Amanda had a few recommendations, so we'll also just share those with you at the end via email so that you could share that out with everybody that uh, came to the call. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah. definitely. And, um, Oh, yeah. Sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say that when the recording is going to be available, we will put it onto our YouTube channel and uh, we will share that on our Facebook page as well. That sounds good. Um, and then, of course, like if anyone needs help, like more direct help with their plants, we're happy to, to take a look at your garden, at your house plants, and figure out what's going on um, or even give you recommendations. So we're happy to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you, thank you Amanda. It's such a late hour for you. Yeah, thank yes. you. Really appreciate how patient you were with our questions. Yes. Absolutely. Well, that's the best part, honestly. <laughs> thank you so much. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ankur. This was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Dad. Thank you, Ankur. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.